Hi everyone. Hello. OG Rose here. We thought we'd just have a little informal conversation. Yeah, discussion here about the paper or some of the work we've been working on. We thought we'd start with aesthetics then ethics. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, just sort of discuss the paper and a lot of times how how our work goes is that you know, we discuss the ideas along the way in the editing process and right. the we refining process. Them. Right, yeah, right. so it's it's nice to be able to bounce ideas off of each other, and we thought um, it might be fun to do so tonight. Oh, yeah, and for anyone out there trying to do different works, I mean, you want to have some sort of dialectical process, whether it be you write something, you think of something, then you read a book, and then you bounce off the book, then you talk to someone and go back and forth, because, you know, you hear all the time about people wanting to come up with ideas and figuring out to write things, but then they just kind of sit on a rock and put a fist under their chin and <laughs> try to think of something. It doesn't yeah. quite work like that, but then mm -hmm. all your metaphors and classic imagery mm -hmm. from society gives you that impression, when really it's found in this, um, almost this play space yeah. this kind of space of play between these different things well i was thinking what hope do we have for transcending attraction um you know the paper talks about beauty and maybe this is slipping into the paper on beauty but you know i think that uh, beauty is something that's attractive right mm. but it is more than just right i don't know i think in some ways and i i don't want to be critical of our current uh Cultures, paradigms guess, yeah but yeah. but there is i feel as though there could be an automatic ju jump to just, you know, attraction and sex and, and, and all, all of that, that. Right. which there's a place for that. And there's beauty in that, but it's not the, it's not the only thing. It's not the, even the driver, I would say for beauty, right. um, maybe attraction, moth to light. That's what I always think about with beauty. Mm. Um, you know, moths always go to light. Light is attracting. It, it draws people in mm -hmm. and people want to come and they want it because, well, if we think about traditionally light would be fire. So it's warm. You know, it's 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 a source of so many things, and it draws people in. And then they can not only can they see, but they can be seen. Right. You know, you can only see yourself or mm. have others see mm. you if you're coming close to that that source of light. Mm. And that mm. for me is what beauty, I think, is really about. Well, that's interesting. The idea that when you're pulled into someone, then if we use that light metaphor, you can't even see yourself without being in the presence of the other person. And mm -hmm. that's interesting because I guess that it, there's a few things. I think there's a, like a Rumi poem about a moth oh, attracted yeah. to fire. And it's this uh, kind of, if they get too close, they get burned. <laughs> you know, they die. But then also if they're um, not close to the fire, they freeze to death. Mm -hmm. And I guess that also that you have when it comes to like relationships, the, yeah. I think it's called the hedgehog dilemma. The idea mm -hmm. where you have these two hedgehogs and, you know, they want to be close, but as they come close, they hurt each other more. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the problems actually is when attraction is uh, nothing more than, we could say, horizontal. And if we make a distinction between uh, pretty or uh, sexy or all those different terms, um, and beauty is deep, then one of the things mm -hmm. happens is if you don't have a depth, then mm -hmm. the likelihood of love being like a flame that burns you as mm -hmm. opposed to a flame that illuminates you increases a lot because mm -hmm. you need those depths. Um, because on the surface, mm -hmm. like, uh, well, if you have two, like, billiard balls hitting one another and you only have the surface dilemma, the surface dimension, then they're going to hit each other. Yeah. But if you have a lower dimension, maybe they could go under each other, they can work together, they can kind mm -hmm. of not always have conflict. So yeah, depth um, orders uh, another dimension. But it's also like, on the flame, yeah. it reminds me, I guess, of Boober's I, um, I and it or something, I and thou. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true what you're saying is that this idea that the... Um, that it is only in the, the context of a relationship, mm -hmm. kind of a dialectical relationship, mm -hmm. that the true self is unveiled. Uh, and and so, so I like that metaphor yeah. you're using there on the flame. Right, there's also something too, really two quick things, the bill, billiard bar, balls um, hitting together. There's only conflict if they're superficial, right? right? If there's only the one dimension, it's just they just hit each other, boom, mm -hmm. you know? Whereas if there's deeper layers, they can, you know, work around there's each more other, dimensions. spin each other, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. So they can work in conjunction with X each other besides axis, just conflict right. or hitting each other physically. Yeah, right. um, so there's that. And then also with the fire, I think that's such, again, I love that. I love the analogy of the fire as beauty because you can't hold it. You can't touch it. Mm. You can't touch it directly. Kind of like how, you know, th this idea of unveiling God, what God, it would, it would just kind of consume us. Sure. You know? sure, sure. So this idea that the fire, there's something about it where I think in my own personal life, I feel like when when I was con confusing beauty, like sometimes I would feel this real strong attraction for someone, something, and yet it, it um, you know, that type of force was, was so strong. So you think, oh great, this is beauty, like I'm experiencing sure. beauty, but it was really suffocating at the same time because 
um, I try and hold it. You know, what do you do if you put your hand over a candle? It suffocates it, like the, the flame goes right, out. So, so you either get burned by fire or it goes, it gets snuffed out by this kind of trying to hold it yourself, you know? So I think that that's, that's why I, yeah, it just oh, to me, yeah, I feel like that, and, that sort of puts it in the right. And, um, I think also for, for that, um, there's this idea, uh, as well with, uh, in the paper, it talks about beauty with mystery, and yeah. the idea of mystery is that the, it doesn't mean something that you can't know at all, but something that, that as you know, it turns out that there's more to know, uh, and you can go on forever, that this is sort of infinity, and, yeah. um, you know, there's always that question, I think Peter Kreef talks about it, that how is it that you don't get bored in heaven, like if heaven goes on mm -hmm. forever, and what he says is that people are infinitely interesting. Uh, and likewise, mm -hmm. God is infinitely interesting, therefore there's never boredom because it's always interesting. And also, too, therefore, you could associate uh, heaven with uh, flow state, you know, and creativity flow state, that sort of timelessness. Mm -hmm. And where um, sort of divine time in that sense uh, is not a state of the continuation of time, but a state in which the concept of time is completely transcendent. And so likewise, uh, that's what's kind of supposed to happen in love, uh, where, you, where you have the relationship, you have this sort of sense where it's... Uh, you know, you're, you're together forever, uh, and then the name of the game is if you have that mystery part of it, the relationship doesn't become boring, it doesn't yeah. become like the, uh, the doing it again, it doesn't mm -hmm. become a grind, because you always have that, um, that, uh, that mystery that keeps it alive and, and going. Right. Um, and, and, and I think what, but however, in order to see um, someone as beautiful, uh, then the uh, then you have to see that mystery. But if you do that, then there's something bigger than you. And if there's something bigger than you, then that can be an ego shock, right? You know. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, that gets into Burke's idea of the sublime, mm -hmm. uh, which I would say the paper on beauty is uh, that notion and Kant or Burke that talks about the sublime is the most influential. And for for Burke, he gives the example of like a thunderstorm, where when you go outside and you see this massively great and magnificent thing, it makes you feel small. But actually in that feeling of smallness, uh, it makes you feel wonderful because like the world is so much bigger mm -hmm. than you. Mm -hmm. And that actually can be encouraging because if you yeah. think the world can be reduced to you, well, that's pretty mm -hmm. boring. But at the same time, you can either, when you encounter something bigger than you, you can either mm -hmm. let there be an experience of the sublime, which is actually um, lifts you up you know, is a good thing, mm -hmm. or you can take it in a direction where it hurts your ego and you deny it. And so when it comes to love, it you can choose either for love to be something sublime, or you can choose for something, you say, no, I don't want to accept that. So you deny the, uh, the element of beauty in the, in the love, in, in, the, in the sublime and the mystery, and then therefore you're stuck with attraction. Well, well then you have the conflict. You only have the, uh, the, the horizontal. Right. I think what's interesting to me is this, like, discerning between the sublime because I don't I think in the experience of it you're like oh no I'm embracing the sublime sure you know it's it, to have that awareness of oh okay is what's really leading me you know and is it is it the is it the sublime or is it the attra the attraction and the conflict sense like you oh, yeah, regard, or, or the burning you know you're getting too close this sort of sure. and I think it's really the possessiveness this is the it's possessive yeah, yeah, you know, it's yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, a golem yeah. effect you know you just yeah. want to hold it and it's yours it's yours it's yours and as soon as it gets into that dynamic I think it's slipping into the the the, the superficial attraction um, which can feel very deep but which is actually honestly very very super it's just very shallow well i mean there's it's, the problem where no one would do anything bad if they didn't like feel like it was good right yeah, you know sure. there's like you have to have good motivation so likewise if people felt like a relationship was merely attraction uh -huh. then it wouldn't function so uh -huh. there has to be something that in the experience makes you believe it's something more yeah. than that yeah. uh and yeah. so then uh but i think you're exactly right then there's the question of your own motive yeah. metaphor uh motives and you have that great metaphor where you talk about you know the bird yeah. that is flat in somebody's hand and the bird that's held by the leg and the question is who really owns the bird yeah, yeah. and so one of the ironies is that in the state you know when you try to be possessive you know, when you're clinging the bird by the legs, you don't actually own it, no, <laughs> you know, yeah. but the bird that well, can fly off and come yeah, back, you know, right. you really, really own it. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I mean, too, with that analogy, it's like who, who has, you know, what type of relationship do you, do you want to be able to have the bird that, you know, will fly off and come back to you? I mean, that's right. a true relationship, right? right. It wants to come back to you. 
Whereas right. like it's on a, you know, it's on a chain. It's trying to desperately flap its wings That's and right. get away from you, you know, or try to be free. You need to right. let it be free, which is like what's in the bluebird. Oh, yeah. No, that, that's a tremendous movie. And they yeah. have that notion of being apart but synchronized, but then they're together and there's dissonance. And yeah. that, you know, really profound uh, way of showing that yeah. uh, that I think you can only do in a, a film. Uh, well, and also what's interesting, like if you view, you know, if you have a category of beauty as mystery as something bigger than you, then the idea of holding it mm -hmm. is absurd. You know, that you, yeah. you can't do that. So, so, when, you, so when you have um, beauty that is not merely uh, attraction and it's a much more robust definition that radically transforms what you believe is the mm -hmm. proper way to treat people and therefore mm -hmm. there is ethical implications therefore yeah, it becomes ethic it becomes unethical to hold the bird by the legs Absolutely. and it becomes ethical to have an open hand but yes. if you don't have a concept of beauty that is robust then you can rationalize holding the bird by the legs as you know making sure it doesn't get itself hurt you're protecting it because mm -hmm. otherwise it would fly off and get attacked by crows or something <laughs> you you create yeah. space for rationalization yeah. but if you have a robust concept of the of, of beauty mm -hmm. Sure. then you cannot rationalize that as good and you have yeah. to have the open hand, mm -hmm. uh, which then gets where well, you have to be vulnerable and there's all these right. um, you know, different uh, crossovers with yeah. love. So, so, so therefore, one's, it is very important that one's um, understanding of beauty is robust because that has ethical consequences. Yeah. I guess I always correlate it with love because that's another you know, strongly well, that, because, interesting well, topic. Yeah, yeah, oh, right, absolutely. Right, right. Yeah. But it, but it, it, it's uh, hard to see something beautiful and not love it. Yeah, right. Right, absolutely. I mean, you, you feel a sense of, like, you know, love. You love. Attraction. Yeah. A painting, Grand Canyon, whatever. They right. go together. Right, right, right. So it's hard not to just see it in that context, but, but love is also, you know, informs our ethics. You know what I mean? It's, there's, <laughs> we have. Yes. So, anyways, I mean. Well, I that, well, the effort, what's, I think, killed ethics, generally, is the effort for a um, passionless ethic. Like an ethics that you follow just because you mentally assent that it is right to do X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. And, you know, even the problem is that that completely ignores the reality of human motivation. I can know that I should do X and I don't do it. Right. You know, just because I right. know abstractly that X should be done, it doesn't sure. follow that I will do X. And especially not that I will do X when it's hard. There has to be some height, there has to be something motivating it. Right. Um, Spinoza talks about. And that's what Justin was mentioning. You know, Spinoza talks about joy being the, at the backbone of ethics, where, mm -hmm. you know, it's the joyful person that then does ethical things. Uh, I would associate it with beauty because then, because um, my, with Spinoza, it can be your joy, which could lead into a selfishness, even though I think Spinoza, of course, as a great genius, had a much deeper under you know a, a broader understanding of joy but it could yeah. be misinterpreted uh -huh. but when we're talking about beauty that mm -hmm. beauty beauty inherently motivates um ethical action you're looking outward you know beauty tends to be things mm -hmm. you see mm -hmm. as things that are beyond you precisely because mm -hmm. they're mysterious and you can and you could certainly see yourself as beautiful i mean if you especially if you can configure yourself within a divine schema of god you know christianity image of god likeness god and so forth and so on right. but there's something about beauty that is more external and yeah. so then you're treating like um and well, like right. when the paper talks about like when you see a beautiful painting no one has to force you to treat it with care you just do mm -hmm. when you see something beautiful you don't need laws you you naturally view it with all yeah. well and it's interesting there's kind of a, um i was you know there's this sort of fixed you know you're fixed in awe of what is beautiful yeah that's right and yeah. it's almost like Great, you're fixed and you're, you're 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 almost in this frozen state. Can't do anything bad, <laughs> no. But right, I mean, right, there's right, this right. kind of sense, not just that you're fixed and paralyzed, but but that you are in a way, you know, uh, struck you're by struck. by the goodness of it. You don't want to move and, because the, the moment will put you want to like stop moving so nothing yeah, changes. Yeah. You're in right. the moment. Yeah, there's really like a, a sense of just you know being standing there in awe and appreciating it and being grateful for it and and you know like you said you're not going to destroy something you're grateful for you know you're going yeah. to uh, uh, oh no <laughs> and, and, and if you find something beautiful you're probably grateful for it oh yeah absolutely <laughs> well and i think also this gets into um one of the big mistakes of thinking that theological ethics following like christianity or theological ethics that it was merely that people were ethical when they believed in god because they were afraid of god you know, there's a that God told you, therefore you're afraid of going to hell and, and so mm -hmm. forth and so on. And of course that plays a role. But also a very pivotal idea in theological ethics is that if God created the world 
and God created people, mm -hmm. then there is a design. In a mm -hmm. sense, every painting is art. Every oh, painting yeah. is, is made. 100%. And so there's a, a there is aesthetic, there is a um, aesthetic ethics mm -hmm. in theology mm -hmm. That um, once you remove God, like you have in modernity, post-modernity, or post-post-post-modernity times five or whatever, uh, then mm -hmm. uh, you know, then then you still have that problem of needing people to be ethical, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily having a universal schema of everything be a created work of art. You know, you can still imagine it as fortunate. Richard Dawkins tries to talk about how you know the chances of being alive are so low, and you know the what are the likelihood of the universe coming to be, and therefore things are beautiful out of you know, the, the, it's kind of magical because what are the chances of things being? So you can try to do that. You can come up with schemas. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, generally speaking, that doesn't seem to work very well for the majority, and that would be a whole other discussion. But, with, mm -hmm. but what I don't think has been appreciated in theological traditions is if you have a God who created the world and everything is art, and therefore there is an aesthetic relationship to the world of which inherently entails ethical uh, behavior mm -hmm. that we've only that ha that theological ethics have only been thought in terms of law-like commands right. and I think that's been a um, that's contributed to people not understanding the role of aesthetics mm -hmm. and ethics mm -hmm. no 100% and I mean if the design there's a beauty in it I mean you think about it people want to go to the Grand Tetons or they want to go see these like natural beauty you know these sites yeah absolutely kind of get away and see the, these beautiful creations well if the design in an inherently is beauty, then it's in, there's an inherent ethic ethics that's then would be, would then be promoted. Absolutely, I mean, you think that that, that would follow, right? Yeah, and so you know, for me, and and uh, you know, we should close before the the kids wake up. So you know, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I, it, it it is late night chats with the with yeah, the right. Show. You know, when the kids go to bed. <laughs> um, so it it is completely critical that uh and i mean as we're gonna as we do in so many of the, the project the mm -hmm. fate of beauty mm -hmm. is really to argue that aesthetics and beauty are central to oh. the entire socioeconomic order that mm -hmm. uh you know we get the creative concord where mm -hmm. beauty inspires creativity and creativity is what keeps the socioeconomic order going therefore yeah. if you don't have creativity you have the marxist um uh creative destruction the uh the material dialectic mm -hmm. d destroy get, falls apart we have yeah. beauty as essential to ethics i mean really we do like if you go to colleges in general they don't even have aesthetic department like aesthetic philosophy is not even something mm -hmm. you can take and so you have very few thinkers in it i mean mm -hmm. there are some i mean mm -hmm. aline scary uh roger scruton before he passed but generally aesthetic philosophy and theology even mm -hmm. uh is is kind of no one knows what to do with it or they don't teach it um, yeah. and, 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 and if it is true that aesthetics is somehow central, mm -hmm. um, to the entire socioeconomic order, mm -hmm. then this is a essential, essentially dire yes. mistake. Oh yeah. Uh, and, 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 and it needs to be, um, uh, the, the, the fate of beauty is the fate of us. Yeah. 100%. Well, thank you, Daniel. No, thank you, Michelle. Hmm. I want to get back to the fire analogy another time because my brain's coming up with all these other you know no I really like what you was I mean the idea of other, like well, you know you analogy. see your the other is fire and you see yourself as you're close mm -hmm. to the other and well yeah I just think there's so much too about you know it's kind of like the the, the, the low golden rule you know treat others the way you want to be treated well mm -hmm. there's something about beauty informing your you know kind of um informing your ethics kind of just not giving you a natural motivation for your ethics right Yes. That also then is allowing you to be treated well as well, treated with respect and, and kindness and uh, awe and all of that. Because, you know, as you approach the fire, your face is illuminated. You are, you are known. You are seen. Mm. Mm. So it's like when you approach beauty, you will also be illuminated. In yeah, beauty sense. sounds so, back upon Yeah, you. right. So, so I think there's just... Oh, there's other stuff too with with the, the touching and the destruction of it, but yeah, it's beauty. There, there's so much more, but we we can get more into that analogy later. I want to flesh it out some more sometime. No, uh, lovely, lovely. Well, thank okay. you. Well, thank you, and uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, thank you everyone for thank listening. Thank you so much. And uh, for hope more. you enjoyed. <laughs> yeah, I hope you enjoyed. For tell more. us, tell us if you like this because yeah, we'd yeah. be happy to do more if you're if you're. Yeah, this was just a fun idea we yeah. had. So uh, <laughs> for more, please visit ogrose.com. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like us on Instagram, share any of the work. We'd appreciate. You know, we're trying to do more of that. We uh, start doing cat pics. We don't even yeah, we we'll just cat. do cat pics. We just dress you know, Daniel up like yeah, a cat. And we'll play a piano or something. Cat pics. You know, Cats that's, the ground. You know, we've really been doing this wrong. <laughs> we've got to fix that. But 
uh, but anyway, uh, thank you for your time, and yes. uh, and this has been OG Rose.